there. Hi, welcome back to my channel. It's been a hot minute or two since I've done a vlog, so I figured why not do one today? And check my framing. It's snowing out. I guess that's what happens in January. And wife works late tonight, so I figured, you know what, now's a good time to do it. Got a new toy this past weekend. Went down to Midwest Photo in Columbus, Ohio. Great store if you've never been there. And picked up a Fuji 6x9 GW693. When we went to Hawking Hills back in November, we did as we always do when driving through Columbus and stopped in at Midwest. And they had a couple there. And I started drooling. <laughs> and, well, as fortune would have it, I was able to get it. Uh right on New Year's Eve day. So I've already ran a roll through one time. Got another roll uh, that I just finished off today. Shot yesterday, which would be Wednesday. And had two more images today. And we're going to develop and see what they look like. Alexa, kitchen off. Technology. Now I am going to kill the lights because the first roll I ran through... I ran it through cockeyed. And when I developed the roll, or when I opened the back of the camera, I noticed that it loaded back into the take up spool incorrectly, which led to some light leak. So I'm going to open it in a darkened area, and it feels good. Okay. It didn't load in incorrectly. So, shouldn't have any light leaks. It looks like the rest of the 120 film that I shoot. So let's get this baby out of here. Get my chemicals mixed up and we'll get to developing. Now the tools I use to develop film at home and the kitchen sink are pretty straightforward. Uh, first of all, my film. I shot T-Max 100, got my tank, my Patterson tank, I got my, here I'm going to do this, big box of chemistry. I always mix fresh anytime I shoot. I don't like leaving chemistry lying around mixed. Uh, I did that way too much back in the olden days, and then... I think that was part of my quality control issues I had when I was a younger photographer. Sorry, that noise. It is the kitchen sink and there was stuff in there. Currently, what I'm using to develop is... Where did it go? It's right here. <laughs> Rodinol. I've been seeing lots of videos about Rodinol. Um, it's fine grain mixture. It's, uh, you know, really good tones. And on another trip to Midwest, I decided to pick up a bottle. It's insane. You can do 1 to 50 or 1 to 25 mixtures on it. So this stuff will last forever. Uh, I had a, it was weird. I had a roll of, eight, uh, uh, not a roll, a bottle of HC 110 and didn't use it all in time because it started forming crystals. Now, when you're, at least for me, when I'm taking photos, I always want to make sure I got good chemistry, good mixes, etc. And... I thought, you know what? Nah, I'm not going to use it. I don't want a crystal to get in there and scratch the negative in the tank. So I tossed it, got the rod and all, and have been happy with it so far. I've developed several rolls, and it looks pretty good. Another big tool that I use, and mind you, none of this video is sponsored. This is just my personal opinion for the tools that I use to do what I do. There is a great program on... The app store and i believe they have it for all for both android and apple and it's just basically called massive dev chart they're a website i know that they've been around for a long time but it's an application you can load onto your iphone your android your tablets whatever gives you a list of options for the type of film you're shooting what chemistry you're using the temperatures 
And you can actually, if it's not right on that 20 degree Celsius mark, which there's so like everything's 20 degrees Celsius, let's say you're 19.8, it'll you just go in and adjust the temperature and it'll add the amount of seconds you need, which is great. So it takes really all the guesswork out. It's a countdown timer. Uh, it tells you every minute to agitate for 10 seconds and et cetera, et cetera. When to dump, when to rinse, when to stop bath fix, all the good stuff. So definitely a tool I love using. What I'm going to do at this point is I'm going to take my canister out, open my canister, get the film spool out, and take off my iWatch. <laughs> One of the Apple Watch. One of the funniest things when I first started developing film, again, myself, that I didn't even think about until I was sticking my hand in the bag to start the process was, hey, wait a second, dummy. You better take your Apple Watch off because anytime you move, it comes on. And you really don't want to waste a roll of film getting fogged from your Apple Watch. So just keep that in mind. It's funny, after all these years uh, that went by, you know, well over 20, not longer, of not loading film onto a reel, that it literally took no time for me to do it again. I mean, I, I did buy a roll of expired film, 120 particularly, because, yeah, I, I had done it back in the late 80s, early 90s, but I hadn't done it since the late 80s and early 90s, and developing it was kind of a mystery, uh, or again, so, yeah, it's good to know. But now it's just, again, so second nature, and it seems easier to me sitting somewhere with the light bag, getting the film out from the paper backing, getting it onto the reel, getting it loaded into the tank, then going downstairs in the one bathroom that's completely light tight and standing there in front of the mirror and doing that, so. You're welcome, it's on your brain now. It's weird, once you learn how to see with your hands in the dark. It's not something you forget real terribly. And the fact that I can sit here in the light, not looking at it, but oh, looking at it with my eyes, using my hands, my fingers, that's pretty cool. There we go. Pull it on there, give a couple more spins so it gets towards the center. I always feel better with it being towards the center more so that it doesn't come loose and off and all that jazz. Ta-da. Okay, so with the film loaded, Oh, another thing too. I shared it real quick. I'm going to share it again. One of the best investments I got was this white crate or this uh, unfinished crate at uh, one of the craft stores because I can just keep everything in there. And then when I'm done, I can put it up in the closet. It's out of the way. My wife doesn't want to kill me because I've got stuff lying around everywhere, uh, which is helpful. <laughs> so there's that. So now to mix the chemistry. Another good buy. Again, this video is not sponsored by anybody. These are just the things that I do. This measuring cup. Got this at Ikea for a couple bucks. It is the best measuring cup I've ever used. Next to this little one. Also an Ikea purchase. It has from an ounce all the way up to one full cup, eight ounces. So it's very helpful because this starts at uh, four ounces. So I don't have to figure out where one ounce is. I can just use this little gem. Another thing I use, distilled water, especially this time of the year. With the temperature fluctuating in the house, because it's cold outside, it's currently, I think, 19 or so degrees out there right now. Uh, it's easy to just buy a big bottle of distilled water, let it sit out in the 
room for a while and it'll pretty much give you a room temp 20 degrees celsius 68 degrees fahrenheit kind of deal another thing i got off of amazon this little digital thermometer i love this thing had the old school thermometers where you gotta sit there and you gotta look at that little line and you gotta figure okay is it exactly at 20 degrees or is it 19.8 and this just takes out all the guesswork because it is right stinking on with the exact temperature so for this batch of film i am going to do 1 to 25 for my mixture um just because it's quicker easier uh, it's faster with the development. I've done 1 to 50, and I've done 1 to 25, and I really didn't see much of a difference. I mean, there could be, so who knows? Uh, but for this purpose, we're just going to do this. So what I'm going to do is fill this measuring cup to 24 ounces of water, and then fill this little one with one ounce of rotten all and another ounce of water, and then we'll mix them together. Oops. Another reason I like using distilled water, too, is because I don't have to worry about any impurities that are in the water. Uh, yes, I do have a filter on my tap, but you never really know for sure, right? So, just takes the guesswork out. Don't have to worry. Ooh, that was good. Right on. Don't have to worry about any other variables besides your temperature. This stuff's kind of cool. It's got a little hole in there, so only a little bit will come out at a time. And you can see it comes out in a dark color from the research I did online. That happens, but everything I've read has said the stuff has like a half-life like radiation. So it'll be around for a while. Which is good, because I don't shoot as much as I'd like, especially during this time of the year. And... I don't waste anything because it really hurt having to toss out that entire bottle of HC 110. Another good investment? Yeah, well, I'm pretty sure it was Ikea. A little set of funnels. Just keeps everything nice and easy mixing it in. Just 24 ounces of water, ounce of Rodinol, ounce of water. I use these little bottles since I only make batches of chemistry as I shoot. Got these a dollar general for a couple bucks. Get a little mix to mix it all up. Take my digital thermometer, pop it down in there. And survey says 19.8. That seems to be the going temperature in the house in the wintertime. So which is 67.7 uh, Fahrenheit. So 19.8. So we're gonna let that sit with the thermometer in there. I think we can all agree that that 19.8 is gonna be across the board since all this chemistry is stored together. Now let's mix some stop bath. That's a one to 19. But with that one, I more or less eye it half the time since it doesn't have to be Exact, exact. At least I think. There. I would say that's 19 ounces. For my stop bath and for my fixer, I use Elfert. I know that there's a you know a lot of different schools of opinion out there for the chemistry you use, and that's fine. I just prefer to use liquid. Much easier to store, mix together. Again, going back to a comment I made earlier, um, I don't like leaving chemistry lying around for large periods of time uh, because, you know, I do have a day job. I do also shoot digital, so I'm not always shooting film. And... It's just nice to have kind of on-demand 
chemistry. And now for the fix. Again, Ilford fixer, rapid fixer. I always use the one to four dilution. So we're going to use 16 ounces of water and four ounces of fix. Ah, uh, I love the smell of fix in the early afternoon, late afternoon, early evening. My wife always calls me an alchemist while I'm doing this part, mixing everything together, my potions. Okay, so I'll put that off to the side for now the lid on the fix. Okay, we're going to do one more check of our developer. Still, hope you can see that, 19.8 degrees centigrade. So this is the fun part. I'm going to try and capture this the best I can, so please bear with me because I'm still noob when it comes to shooting videos. So here's the basic layout of the Massive Dev app. Um, as you can see, I've got a lot of different film stocks and chemistry mixtures I've used over the past couple of years since I've used this. But we'll walk through creating a new uh, recipe, if you will, for this batch. So I'm going to select the plus sign up in the corner. I'm going to select 120 film. I'm going to press K for Kodak. And then Tmax 100. Now it's going to ask what type of developer you want to use. In this case, I'm using Rodinol, 1 to 25, and I shot it all at ISO 100. So there, it creates a new entry in the table. Sorry. A new entry in the table down at the bottom, and then you can go in and adjust it for your needs. So first thing we're going to do in here is press Edit, and we're going to change the temperature. Right now, the recommended is six minutes at 20 degrees centigrade, but we're gonna press that button to go into that menu. Select the time temp conversion, press the 20 degrees there, and you'll see down on the bottom, a little scroll wheel comes up, and we're gonna set it for 1980, which works out to be 19.8. And when you click save, you can see that it added five seconds to the development time from the uh, six minutes that it had by default. For the wash, well, I don't use Hypo, which I've been wanting to, and I just never get around to buying it. So we're going to take that out of the equation. And for my fix, five minutes is all they recommend, but I've found it better to use seven full minutes. So I'm going to click Save. going to click, and you can see it, the other information here, Agitation Scheme, the first minute, and then every 10 seconds for every minute following. So we're gonna save it, so we're ready to go. Okay, we've got the iPad set up over here, ready to go with the massive dev app with all our calculations put in. I did one final check on the developer. I, uh, 19.8 degrees centigrade, the tank's in here, ready to go. I've got the lid to put on top of the tank. What I do, again, your mileage may vary. I always fill it first, secure the lid, then start the timer. couple seconds without any agitation. I don't think ever really kills it. Okay, we're secure. Start. And then you start the clock. And normally I would have music on, but I don't want to get busted for any YouTube copyright claims because I do enjoy 80s alternative music. And I'm sure they would definitely ping me quickly and say, hey, your video is muted, or there's a copyright claim, and you're a bad person. Pause a minute. Give it two taps for the air. And then we wait until the next minute when we do it for 10 seconds. When it gets to the minute point, it'll chime. And then tell you it's time to agitate. 
like I said, it tells you to do a 10 minute agitation, or I'm sorry, 10 second. And I usually get four full inversions and back with a tap or two. Okay, we're coming up on minute six. Um, so we're going to have to agitate for 10 seconds because it is a minute. And then we're going to have to dump it out quickly after that. Actually, we're not gonna do that because we got five seconds left, so I'm just gonna give it a little agitation. There's the bell, and we dump. Now I've noticed with T-Max, with Rodinol, it goes in looking pretty clear, comes out looking like watered down coffee. So I think that's pretty safe to say that some magic happened. Now it's time for stop that. And that is a full minute agitation. And stop bath, it's, you can use water. Um, however, stop bath is the more trusted method of halting all the developing process and cleaning, getting things ready for the fix. So just started the timer. And <laughs> cancel. <laughs> All right then, I won't. Thank you, Siri. It's amazing how these things listen to you. Now, I consider this another test roll. It's only the second roll I've run through my new, new to me camera. Um, I got some decent results uh, the last time, except um, I forgot to take the lens cap off. I'll share that story in a minute. See how it changes the color with the stop bath in there too. I love the magenta e purple hue. So now we're gonna put in the fix and I always give it a couple shakes just to make sure everything's good and mixed. Pour the fixer in there. Seal the lid. Start the timer. Now the agitation for the fix goes a full minute. Uh, then you 10 seconds every minute after that. So while it's fixing, I'm going to share a little little tidbit of photo goodness that uh, I should have known, I should have remembered, but it's been so many years since I used a rangefinder camera. Now, pretty much everybody's familiar these days with a digital camera, um, even a film camera, uh, most film cameras, uh, like a 35 millimeter or something. When you look through the lens, or when you look through the back of the camera and you're looking through the lens, it's bouncing off of a mirror, an SLR. Well, if you have the lens cap on, you'll notice. But when you're using a rangefinder, it's not looking through the lens. It's looking through another mechanism on the side. And then you use the two objects on a rangefinder to get your focus set. So I was all excited last Sunday. My wife and I went out for a ride, went driving around before we got groceries. I'm like, okay, I want to take some pictures. It was a very gray day. It wasn't a great day for shooting, really. But I'm like, I, I just want to test it and see. And we drive around town. I got a couple images that I took in Denison and uh, one more in New Philadelphia. But I forgot to take the lens cap off for half, more than half the roll. <laughs> so I had a whole bunch of blank, which, rookie move. I get it. But one, one important thing to note was shooting 120 film, like everybody's familiar with. 24 exposure, 36 exposure when it comes to a 35 millimeter camera, you know, the old school stuff. But with 120, you get various amounts of exposures per the type of format you're shooting. Now, if you're shooting a six by four and a half, 4.5, you can get 15 exposures on a roll of 120 film. 
if you're shooting six by six, the traditional square, you get 12 exposures on a roll. Um, don't quote me on the six by seven and six by eight, but with six by nine on a roll of 120 film, you get eight exposures. That's it, eight pictures. They don't make 220 film anymore. If they do, I don't know where to find it. I would actually love to have some 220 film to be able to double the amount of exposures, of exposures I use with either my new Fuji 6x9 or my Yashica 6x6. Because 12, 8, just isn't enough. That is and it isn't. I find that I'm more focused with what I'm shooting, more on what I'm doing, and not just wasting film. Because film's expensive. Chemistry is expensive. When you think about it, your time is expensive. Your time has worth. Now, this I enjoy because this is my meditation, my quiet time, my time to, you know, reflect on what I shot or just the world or whatever I have on my mind. This is what I like to do to relax and unwind. Uh, but I also am, like, freaked out. Oh, jeez, I hope something came out. So uh, another four minutes or so, we'll see. Okay, like I stated before, um, I personally use seven minutes to fix my film. Uh, I know that the uh, app says five's okay, but I got specs on my film in the past uh, when I was scanning it, and one of the things I read was you're not fixing it long enough. So I added two minutes, and I haven't really seen those specs much since. So we're coming up on minute seven here. I'm going to take off the lid because it should be light sensitivity is gone. Two, one, zero, we're gonna dump out and we're gonna take a peek and I see some images on there. However, I don't like taking it out of the spool before I'm done just because it's a pain in the butt to get back in. So now we go to the washing stage and this stage is very important because you've had all this lovely chemistry on your film and you need to get it off. Also, the tone of the film base is still mighty pink so you want to get rid of that as well and that will come off as well so as you can see i got the film propped up in there and i like to make sure that i can get the water going right down the middle so that it circulates in there properly uh, one of these days i would like to find something that i had in college that we used in college it was a big tank with the hose at the bottom and all the water came up from the bottom to the top Circle it or circulating properly around the film and getting it a really good bath. So I'm going to go ahead and start the timer and we'll let this go for 10 minutes. Usually I have to sit here and hold it so the water gets down the tube properly because it always likes to move. Uh, your mileage may vary. This is just how I like to do it. While we await the final washing process here, we're Got four and a half minutes left, and my dog wants water. Hmm. Um, one thing I want to point out, shooting film is great fun, I think. It's come back huge over the past couple of years. Uh, I think the pandemic actually helped it. A lot of people were looking for something to do, and a lot of people picked up film photography either again or for the first time. So there's a lot of channels, a lot of great resources out there. Um, if you're somebody who's looking to start doing it yourself, uh, really the only things you need are the patience, the time to do it, um, understand you are working with chemistry, so there are factors to take into account for there, like making sure they're put away, uh, that's one of the reasons why I keep it up on a shelf in the closet, because when my grandkid is around, my grandson Gideon, uh, I don't want him getting into it, and it's way out of the way, and he won't be able to. Probably the most important tool a photographer can have is a light meter. Um, you can have the incidental light ones, uh, you know, the old handheld ones with a big white dome on it, and you can get your readings that way. Um, personally, I want to get a spot meter, which will allow me to take readings at different points on where I'm shooting and calculate a proper exposure. But the one app that I've been using the most is the light meter app from, I forget who makes it and I apologize. I'll, I'll try and get that in the description. It's available on the app store. I 
believe there was a cost for it, but for the most part, it's pretty accurate. Um, this camera, this Fuji, does not have a light meter built in. So I can't, you know, even get a guesstimate on there. I mean, I get an idea in my head, but I always use the light meter to verify. Um, some of my other cameras, my Yashica has a light meter. Uh, my 35 millimeter cameras have light meters in them. But to be honest, they're all old, so I don't trust them. The app, for the most part, has not let me down. Uh, the Mamiya I had, uh, Mamiya M645, which uh, was traded in offering as part of the offering for the new Fuji. That had a light meter built into the prism, which was kind of rare, but uh, I learned quickly not to trust that thing. It would tell me one thing, I would get home and the film would either be horribly, horribly underexposed or overexposed. Very rarely would it give me accurate readings. So I learned to not pay attention to what that meter said, but to use the app. And the app will go as far as if you want to, will take a snapshot because you are using your phone and you are using the phone's camera to take your light reading. Uh, it can take a snapshot and present you with a little notepad so you can know that on that shot, you used F11 at the 30th of a second. Uh, because unlike digital, you don't always remember what you shot that shot at, what aperture, what shutter speed. So it's a nice way to keep track of your stuff a little more automated. So we're almost done in the moment of truth. Okay, with the washing portion of our development done, we're going to use a little bit of Kodak's PhotoFlow. Now this stuff will last you for a good amount of time. You only need about a cap full to put in your tank. And then you dilute the rest with water. And what that does is it's a wetting agent. It makes it so any water that's on there make it easier to roll off your film and not leave streaks. And that's just a matter of 30 seconds. Filling up the tank with water. Let me show you. As you can see, it's nice and bubbly. And when we're done, we're going to, I'm gonna take it out in the garage, uh, shake off the reel real good to get any excess water off, and then we'll take the film off the spool and see how it looks. We have shot a roll of film. We have developed a roll of film. Now, we take a peek and see, do we have images? Oh, and we do. And we do. There be images there. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to go hang this in the bathroom with the ceiling fan running over it and weighted down with some clips. And we'll come back later and we'll do some scanning. Ooh, exciting. One thing I want to mention with these bottles that I use to store my stuff in, you can see on there I have SB on this bottle, I have Dev on that bottle, and I have, oh, where's the other one? Fix, there it is, I put it off to the side. Fix on the other bottle. I highly recommend doing that just because even though I rinse each of these out after every use, uh, you don't want any cross-contamination to get in your way. You don't want any fix getting in your developer, uh, any chocolate in your peanut butter, all that good stuff. So just another little bit of advice. Keep the same holders for the same thing through your whole process. And with everything neatly back in my handy little crate, we go and put it away. And that's also a marriage saver too, because I don't have anything lying around and my wife will kill me for leaving it lying around. So with that all put away, I'm gonna take a break, my negative is dry, and we'll be back to do some scanning. All right, where I last left off, I just finished developing the roll of film. It's currently in our bathroom with the ceiling fan hanging from the ceiling fan uh, on a coat hanger, and I'll show that setup some other time. I'm not gonna take the camera in the bathroom right now. Uh, but it's running underneath a ceiling fan to help dry it. And uh, then I'm gonna bring it in here and I'm gonna scan it. Now, my process, uh, you know, real photographers, however you wanna look at it, uh, they have a dark room. I wanna have a dark room at some point, um, but I'm probably gonna save that for retirement when I have a lot more time to work with it, where I can 
do it more often, hopefully, um, and have more time to do it because, to be quite honest, uh, having the time to go into a dark room, make a contact sheet, start making off prints, um, it's not my end game. What I find works really well for me is taking the roll of film, running it through my Epson 600 scanner, which can do medium format film. Actually, shout out to the Tuscarawas County Library System for having one of these scanners uh, when I first started doing my own development again, because I was able to test it out and try it and find that I could get very good results by developing it in the kitchen sink, scanning it, and later printing it on my Canon printer. Um, a lot of the work I've sold over the past couple of years has been black and white, has been stuff that I've developed myself and printed myself. I find that with a really good matte paper, the black and white really comes out well. So I'm very happy with the process I have. Yes, having a dark room is something on my list of things I want to do in the future. However, right now, it just makes the most sense to scan it into my computer. Um, I'm not going to go through the process step by step here just because uh, it's long and tedious and will take. it'll be hard to capture with the iPhone that I'm using to shoot. But uh, with the 6x9 film, you cut it into strips of two images each. Uh, that will, the scanner then allows me to put, load the film into a holder. Let me show you here. Like so, fits in here. You lay it down on the scan bed, close the lid, do a preview. It'll go through and scan the image and give you a preview of what it may look like. And then you can do any fine tuning adjustments with the unsharp mask. I always use middle, just my personal preference. Any brightness contrast settings that you want to set. And then finally, the location where you want to save it to and the file type. Uh, I find using a TIFF file gives you the most amount of information. Uh, of course, you know, shooting in digital, you always want to shoot raw. You always want to have the most amount of information available to create your print in post uh, to be able to edit it. I find that using the TIFF format is as close to RAW as you're going to get and does give you a little bit more leverage with how you bring out shadows or contrasts, etc., highlights. So definitely, definitely always put it in TIFF format and go from there. So.